Disco Elysium is a top-down point-and-click buddy cop murder mystery world-building RPG extravaganza. God, that was a mouthful. The first couple minutes of the game is you floating around in the primordial sludge as your personality traits whisper sweet nothings to you. No ball of meat. And these first few minutes introduce you to the main gameplay of Disco Elysium, which is just fucking around and finding out, honestly. Like, it really is just picking the dialogue option you think is the funniest and or the most insane. Taxes are racist. If I hadn't read the Steam page, I would have thought this was a classic 1990s text adventure game from just how much dialogue there is. And to be fair, I should have read the Steam page more, because I extremely underestimated just how fucking big this game was. In the first hour of gameplay, it threw 15 side tasks my way, let me pick over 100 lines of dialogue, and told me about at least 50 different towns and cities to which will probably never be brought up again. Disco Asylum as a whole has about 1 million words of spoken dialogue. And as for tasks and side quests, Disco Asylum consists of four main quests which encompass many smaller tasks and side tasks. Uh, thanks? There's a communist magazine you find in the office of the Dubarjas Union, which talks about man on bear fights being the national sport of the SVR. The same magazine also talks about like, what communism is in this world and like, dogs on capitalism. This is a game truly fitting of the story rich steam tag. Anyway, back on track, when you finally wake up from your brain sludge, one thing becomes apparent. The man on the screen seems to be missing his pants, shirt and jacket, leaving him only in his underwear. The state of the room he's in can only be described as filthy. His tie hanging by the ceiling fan. Bottles of what seem to have been beer, judging by the fact the man is extremely hungover, are scattered across the floor. Wow, this is a cool bit. I sure do hope it shows up later in the video as well. It won't. Anyway, a little later you talk to Mr. Bartender over here, and at the end of the dialogue he says you have to pay your tab. But don't worry, a little skill called Savoir Faire tells me I can slip away unnoticed, and in my playthrough I end up getting away with it scot-free. But a little later I got fucking wrecked by this ginger teenager over here, and me being the dumbass I am forgot to save and had to try my hand at avoiding capitalism again. And I almost killed this old lady doing it, and killed myself. Talking about the bartender, I became a feminist while speaking to him. Talking about feminists. I'm one. And if you want to give me money, you can at ko-fi.com slash amaforst. That's ko-fi.com slash amaforst. Your support can let me eat dinner, meaning I don't die, and getting you more of these wonderful videos. And also thumbnails early, plus that one thing YouTubers do where I put your name at the end of the video. Please. Please, I'm poor. <laughs> anyway. After talking to Mr. Bartender, you've got to go out back and inspect the corpse that just so happens to be hanging from the tree, which has been there for seven days. Seven fucking days, because your dumbass got drunk instead of doing your job. And let me say, this is one of the most visceral and surreal moments I've had playing a game. They did not leave a single thing out. The coloring of his skin, the description of the stench, the oozes seeping from his crevices. You have to do a field autopsy, and as I said, they left nothing out. This is genuinely one of the most detailed descriptions of an autopsy I've seen in media. From having to write down his age, sex, hair color, race, to the injuries inflicted on his body pre and post mortem, to if they were inflicted pre or post mortem, it just kept going and going, description after description, I'll be honest, I feel like throwing up at some points. Remember how four paragraphs ago I talked about the bartender making me a feminist? Well, there's this little game mechanic called the Thoughts Cabinet, where you can internalize thoughts you unlock by picking specific options in dialogue, such as being a feminist. Once you internalize them, over time you will slowly complete the thought, and in my case, fully become a feminist. The thoughts give you advantages, such as the plus one to empathy being a feminist is pretty cool, though they also have downsides, such as being a feminist taking away my potty head nature because, quote unquote, I would have to quit drugs to get there. Which, like, that wasn't the type of character I was building, but, like, still? Kuno doesn't fucking care! Now, remember how I talked about a ginger teenager who fucked me up earlier? Well, that's Kuno, aka one of my favorite characters just because of how fucked up his whole story is, dude. But first, I have to punch the shit out of him to get his story. So, let me just... Okay, so this is C. Kuno talks about C as if she's the fucking boogeyman, calling her crazy and insane, saying she's quote unquote smoked a man. Kuno means she killed someone. That's right, C's a killer. Like, actually a killer? He's meant everything he said before, but right now, he not only means it, 
He is sincere. C showed up in Kuno's house one day just sitting in the corner of the hallway. She was in the hallway, dripping wet, by the fucking shoe rack, in the dark. Why was she dripping wet? Kuno's got no fucking idea. Her hair was all wet. I think she pissed on the floor too. She was there for three days, in the corner, every time Kuno went out. You know this. The body goes into a kind of revulsion shock. Murder hangover. That's what it could have been. Murder hangover? From when she... Killed a kid. Yes. Makes them look for a quiet, dark place and just hibernate there. Usually goes on for a few days, up to a week. Must have been her first one. You only get it on the first one. As to how she got in, Kuno has no fucking clue. He speculates that someone left the door open. As for Kuno's dad, he doesn't even fucking notice her. Or if he does, he just thinks it's Kuno. Talking about Kuno's dad, Kuno gets his, um, ahem, illegal narcotics from his dad. He's a, in Kuno's words, major supplier. But him and his dad had a falling out, and now he has junkies clawing at his door, so he needs you to go and get the drugs for him. Now all that's next is a take on his dad, which I'm not gonna talk about here. Go play the game. Oh, we also learned that Kuno and C are innocent. Well, as innocent as they can be. They didn't kill the man in the tree. Look, Kuno's gonna put you at ease. We didn't do it. Anyway, after the autopsy, I died from sitting in a chair, became a communist. Word on the street is, you're ready to start building communism again. That's about all I can say for the rest of day one. Oh yeah, the bartender makes you pay 100 real for the room you basically trashed. Fucking asshole. Anyway, at the end of day one, Kim Kitsuragi, the best character, takes you out to the balcony so the two of you can discuss everything that's happened that day. Just describing the scene and the dream sequence that comes after wouldn't give either of them the justice they deserve. Please, play the game. Okay, so, like, a lot happened between the publisher and developers. I have no fucking idea what's true or not, so I'm just gonna talk about all of this. But note, it's all alleged. I think. So, Kender, a writer and businessman who worked at Zom, was suing because supposedly Compass, I hope I'm, I really hope I'm saying these names right, bought the rights to the studio's unannounced project for one pound, and then sold the IP back to the company for 4.8 million. And like, all the developers were laid off. Kender then dropped the lawsuit, which then the 4.8 million was repaid to the company in three parts. Kender then went to defend the company from Kurvitz and Rostov's allegations in another court case. Also a quote supposedly says that women were not valued as much. I- I don't know. This whole thing is insanely complicated and just insane. Please just read up on it yourself. The sites I got this information from is in the description. My brain hurts from just talking about it, dude. This video has changed subjects like 20 times and I'm not sure where to go at this point, so I think it's time to end the video. And just talking about the other days would be criminal, genuinely just play the game, I can't spoil anymore. Now, I don't think buying the game is a good idea, knowing all the shit that went on. I'm not saying you should pirate the game, because I'm a good influence, but I can't stop you. And you should play the game, but you shouldn't buy it. This is the part where your names would be if you supported me on Kofi. <laughs> Big thanks to Raxfield for the voice work for everything I didn't do, because I am either lazy or just like it wouldn't have worked with me. Uh, and now the ending talk. This video was heavily inspired by resident YouTuber Up Is Not Jump. Don't call me Up Is Not Jump. This fuck. Like, I only played the game because of this video, and I just stole the bit of having the personality traits from the game in the video from him. Even though I gave up on that bit at the start of the video, I, yeah, th that's all from me. Bye.